Furthermore, a fact that Jerem might find interesting is that only 29 of the 129 lunar meteorites found on Earth were found in Antarctica. 55 were found in Amman, 44 scattered throughout North Africa, and one was found by an Aborigine meteorite hunter in Jera's native Australia. Looks like Von Braun should have gone to Amman if he really wanted to find meteorites to pass off as moon rocks. Firstly, by focusing only on the 29 official lunar meteorites found in Antarctica, one of which was originally identified as a Eucrite before it was declared a lunar sample, Webb ignores the fact that over 400 HED achondrites were found in Antarctica. You know, the ones that, as demonstrated by the Moore County Eucrite, the Kapowita Howardite, DAG-872, and NWA Quadruple XA can closely resemble NASA's Apollo samples in terms of chemistry, mineralogy, and oxygen isotope ratios and subsequently have been believed to be, or outright mistaken to be, lunar meteorites. Secondly, the graph that Webb shows he obviously took from Korotev's site. It's true that to date only one meteorite found in Australia has been officially identified as being of lunar origin. That is, of course, unless you count the thousands, and I mean thousands of tectites, that have been found all over Australia which to this day, scientists still debate as to whether or not they are of lunar origin. But according to Webb's other source, the Aussie lunar meteorite in question was found in 1960, not 1991. I'm guessing that Webb got the idea that Yamato 791197 was the first lunar meteorite found from Korotev's online article for this meteorite. The profile reads, in great big type, so, what's so special about this one? It is the first lunar meteorite to have been found, November 20th, 1979, although it was not recognized to be of lunar origin until the discovery of Allen Hill's 81005, January 18th, 1982. But if we go to the Meteoritical Society's search results on lunar meteorites that Webb shows and scroll down to the bottom of the page, we find the one and only Aussie lunar meteorite listed is dated as being discovered in 1960. Did Webb just do a quick search, find the puny number he wanted to manipulate, and then say, yep, that'll do, without checking what else the website said? This is another example of Webb blindly putting two conflicting sources in the same project and not checking to make sure whether or not they were contradictory. If he did make such a check, he obviously didn't use his technical judgement to make sense of it all. Does he expect no one to check through his bibliography? Now, some of Webb's followers are probably whining that I'm only attacking a trivial mistake. Considering how much that they love to attack trivial details, I didn't think they'd have a problem. Well, don't worry, because I've got gobs more ammunition regarding lunar meteorites. The Allen Hills 81005 meteorite that Webb showed is also listed on Korotev's site. There is something I find interesting that Webb decided not to mention. So what's so special about this one? It's the first rock found on Earth recognized to be a meteorite from the moon. Compositionally, mineralogically, and texturally, it's unlike any other lunar meteorite. So, this rock has a chemical composition, mineralogy, and texture that's unlike any other meteorite believed to have originated from the moon? Didn't Hartman tell us that lunar meteorites were only identified as being from the moon once they were compared to the Apollo samples? So, is Korotev telling us that out of all the 134 lunar meteorites found, Allen Hills 81005 is the only one that matches up in chemical composition and mineralogy to the Apollo rocks? Surely that can't be true, but interestingly, on August 31st, 2009, YouTube user StalkerVision sent me a link to Korotev's profile on lunar meteorite Yamato 793169. So, what's so special about this one? As one of Yamato 79 meteorites, it is one of the first three known lunar meteorites to have been found. It is an unbrecciated basalt. It's unlike any basalt from the Apollo and Luna missions. It is compositionally and mineralogically similar to Asuka 881757 and MIL05035, 
All three were likely launched from the same crater on the moon. If we check the profiles for Azuka 881757 and Mill 05035, we find both of them are also listed as being unlike any basalt from the Apollo and Luna missions. By punching a 10 metre hole in the moon's surface, the probe has uncovered minerals different to the rocks gathered on the surface during moonwalks. Earlier, we learned that a mismatch between actual moon rocks and Apollo samples was found when ESA's Smart One collided with the moon in 2006. Now it seems we also have lunar meteorites that also don't match up, assuming these meteorites are genuinely from the moon. If these meteorites are so different from the Apollo and lunar samples, how do we know that they are from the moon? We asked Korotev this exact question. His answer? Good question. I have a web page about that. With regard to these three meteorites, they're not so different, but they're different. It's subtle things about the chemical composition. Basalts from Earth have concentrations of sodium and potassium that are typically 10 times greater than in lunar basalts. Lunar basalts have concentrations of scandium that are 2 to 3 times greater, and chromium that are 10 to 100 times greater than terrestrial basalts. These features have to do with the lack of volatiles on the Moon, and absence of oxidizing conditions. The Apollo basalts, lunar basalts, and lunar meteorite basalts all have these features. Low volatiles like sodium and potassium, high scandium and chromium. The three meteorites you mention are all richer in scandium than any Apollo basalt, however. That's really a minor issue, but it is a difference. We know the three rocks are meteorites because they all contain rare radioactive isotopes of some elements that can only be produced by interactions with cosmic rays on the surface of the moon or in space. Sincerely, Randy Korotev. Firstly, I find it interesting that Korotev says these radioactive isotopes found in these rocks can be produced only on either the surface of the moon or in space. Note the two options he gives, in space or on the moon. Not one or the other, but both. As for the chemical compositions that Korotev mentions, just to verify, I decided to check once again on the concentrations of sodium, potassium, scandium and chromium. If we look back to the table that Mason and Melson showed for Apollo rocks, terrestrial rocks, eucrites and chondrites, we find that sodium is around 3300 ppm to 4000 ppm in Apollo rocks, 1.6% or 16000 ppm for terrestrial rocks, and 3000 ppm for eucrites. And for potassium, around 1400 ppm to 2800 ppm for Apollo rocks, 5300 ppm for terrestrial basalts, and 400 ppm for eucrites. Korotev told us that the potassium and sodium in Apollo rocks is typically 10 times less than their terrestrial cousins, but evidently this is not the case. When we do the math, we find that moon rocks have 1.9 to 3.7 times less potassium than terrestrial rocks. As for sodium, we find that the Apollo rocks only have four times less than Earth basalts, not ten times less as Korotev told us. And interestingly, the potassium content is in agreement to that of eucrites. Now let's look at the scandium concentrations. According to Mason and Melson, Apollo rocks generally have 47 to 75 ppm, and their terrestrial cousins have 34 ppm. Korotev claimed the Apollo rocks have twice to thrice more scandium than earth basalts. In the case of moon rocks having 75 ppm, this works out to be 2.2 times more, so we'll give Korotev a point there. But in the case of moon rocks having only 47%, this works out to be only 1.4 times more. Finally, the chromium. The chromium content works out to be on the order of 2100 ppm, and the terrestrial rocks are only 120 ppm. This works out to be 17.5 times more than earth rocks. However, eucrites also have a chromium content of 2100 ppm. And we know how vastly similar Apollo rocks are to eucrites. 
similarities that both Koratev and Webb totally didn't mention. All that aside, I find it curious that Koratev tells us that these meteorites simply have a minor difference in scandium content, yet on his site, he hypes in big great type that these three are unlike any basalt from the Apollo and Luna missions. I looked up these rocks on the Johnson Space Center curator's website to see if there is any more to this story, and it turns out there is. Contrary to what Korotev told us, there are significant differences in these meteorites, not minor differences. We downloaded the JSC's paper on Yamato 793169 and looked up its chemistry to find the bulk composition of Y793169 is generally similar to other low titanium and very low titanium mare basalts from the Lunar and Apollo collections. But there are some significant differences. Table 1. First, it is a low magnesium oxide sample, suggesting it is more evolved than many of the Apollo suites. Second, it contains a much higher scandium than many mare basalts, figure 9. Although in general it is slightly enriched in heavy relative to light rare earth elements, it is relatively flat with only a very small europium anomaly. For those keeping score, we have examples of eucrites being believed to be or mistaken for lunar meteorites, so-called lunar meteorites originally identified as eucrites, and now we have lunar meteorites different to Apollo samples. Korotev says these differences are minor, yet the curator's technical paper accompanying this rock tells us that they are significant differences. Which is it? To find out, let's make a comparison. Looking at the chemical composition for these three meteorites and also that of the low titanium Apollo 12, 14, 15 and 16 samples listed in the Handbook of Lunar Soils, there are some interesting differences. The enrichment of scandium and lack of magnesium oxide in these meteorites is quite noticeable. The Apollo 12, 14 and 15 samples generally have twice as much magnesium oxide than all three meteorites. Only the Apollo 16 samples have comparable magnesium contents. As for scandium, the Apollo 12 samples typically have around 40 parts per million of scandium. The Apollo 14 and 15 samples range between 20 to 30 ppm, an exception being sample 15420, which has only 0 0.07 parts per million of scandium. And the Apollo 16 soils generally have 6 to 11 parts per million. But the three meteorites on the other hand generally have scandium contents as high as about 100 parts per million. I'd call that a big quantitative difference. Meanwhile, looking for meteorites not found in Antarctica, we already looked at Dofar 287, which has a higher oxygen 18 value than any Apollo sample or even official lunar meteorites. In Korotev's profile on the sample, we find... So, what's so special about this one? Mostly, it's an unbrecciated basalt. Alternatively, it is a regolith breccia with a big class of basalt. The basalt is distinct from the Apollo and Luna basalts. Korotev also has a profile on another lunar meteorite, this time from southwest Africa, called NWA-773, a part breccia and part gabbro sample. Its profile carries this description. So, what's so special about this one? It is a complex breccia consisting of several coarse-grained lithologies, or rock types. The basalt lithology is distinct from basalts of the Apollo and Luna sites. The olivine cumulate lithology is distinct and unique. No such lithology has been found in the Apollo collection. We looked up the paperwork for this meteorite on the Lunar Meteorite Compendium, and in it we are told... The olivine gabbro contains approximately 50% olivine, 30-40% to pyroxene, and 10-22% to plagioclase. The pyroxenes in the gabbro fall into two distinct groups of low and high calcium pyroxenes, whereas the breccia includes these and more ferroin pyroxenes as are typical for lunar basaltic rocks. 
The nickel and cobalt contents of the olivines are distinct from other basaltic materials, indicating along with other chemical parameters that this group of meteorites is different from any previously known.